Okay, our next next speaker is Stephen Moore. Stephen is a lecturer at University of Cape Coast. Today, his topic is titled Space-Time Multi-Patch Discontinuous Jerky Isogeometric Analysis for Parabolic Evolution Problems. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Yeah. OK, can you hear me now? Yes. OK, so good afternoon. I'm Stephen Moore. Uh, my talk is on space-time discontinuous galactic isogeometric analysis. Um, so I've been working on this for quite some time now since I started my PhD in this area of discontinuous Galekin. So the main references for this, um, for this article, uh, for this talk, uh, is uh, three of my papers uh, on space-time isogeometric analysis uh, with Langa and Neumuller. And then um, the main one that I'm relying on is the third one, which is space-time multi-part discontinuous Galekin, which has been published already in SIAM. Um, so my the outline of my talk is basically on parabolic, going to talk about parabolic problems, give the variational formulations of this in terms of discontinuous Galekin methods, uh, present some discretization error estimates, and then we make conclusions and do some outlooks of what can happen within these methods. So the Parabolic PDEs are really very useful uh, in real life applications. You can have them in finance, in the financial sector, uh, when you have diffusive processes, or in material science, uh, example being the Khan Hilliard and Allen Khan problems. And also, just as um, Pasha spoke about, image processing is also a possibility uh, when you convert the problems into PDEs. So, this is also for optimal optical flow on evolving surfaces. Uh, when it comes to space-time methods, um, there are many approaches that people use or existing literature um, by using the finite element methods or by using finite element methods is really well known all over the world um, from Bank and, and um, Schwab and all, a lot of all these co-authors. There's also been wavelet methods uh, which are used for the space-time methods. Uh, this is by, you can talk of uh, by Christoph Schwab or from um, someone like um, Andreev. Or you can also use the B-splines and nerves, which are also really well known. And usually a lot of these methods, uh, the, the classical methods are they discretize first in space and then they discretize in time by using some Euler, like, uh, Euler, Euler, uh, Euler discretization, Euler schemes, or Crank Nicholson or Rangikuta, whichever time method uh, you like best, you can use it this way. Uh, but what I'm going to talk about is a, is a new approach to space-time methods where we consider time as another dimension in space. So it means that uh, you always consider time as a fourth dimension when you are in three dimension. Or if you are in one dimension in space, then you consider time as a second dimension uh, in this way. So in this sense, we are going to, the computations go always in dimensions of plus one. So, um, a, a, a classical uh, parabolic initial volume problem is posed in this sense. And then in this way, we see um, that we have the whole space-time cylinder Q uh, with respect to the time evolution as well. And then we have the boundaries, uh, and then we have some initial boundaries, and then the final time boundaries, okay? So uh, this is really a standard weak space-time variational formulation. Uh, this is the, the normal standard ones. And this is also in one of my papers. You can find them. Uh, what you usually do is you, you take a test function, you multiply by, you multiply your equation by the test function. So you multiply equation one by a test function V, you integrate. So if you see here, we integrate in space. And that is enough. So we integrate in space, and then you can also integrate in time. This is the idea of the space time. So if you integrate in space and if you integrate in time, you can have a weak space time variational formulation with, a, with a, an anisotropic uh, Hilbert space setting. So you have your, you are finding your weak solution in a 
in an H10 and then subjected to an H11 in this sense, where your anisotropic space time solution is defined by. Hello? Hello? Yeah, we can hear you, Stephen. Oh, okay. So, and then we have the bilinear form and a linear form. If you do your normal weak uh, variational formulation, you will get this bilinear form and the weak form. Okay. So, um, because we are doing um, isogeometric analysis, it's very important to understand the concept of splines and nerve spaces, uh, which are very, very critical. So, uh, usually what happens is that you have a parametric space and then you have a geometric mapping which maps from your parametric space to your computational domain, which is the physical domain. Uh, in the case of the space-time, we have a space-time domain which is a 0 to 1, d plus 1, where d is, uh, d is 1 to 3. And so we have, in this sense, if you, if you have the Q, if you go to the, to the very basic, you have a mesh, uh, and then in this mesh you have uh, for, for this whole domain Q, you have in the domain an underlining mesh. And then in your parametric space-time domain as well, you have an underlining mesh also. So you do this, um, you use your parametric mapping, geometric mapping from your parametric space-time domain into the computational space-time domain. And in the case of space-time, if you go to the 2D, where I show here, you see that um, we have the normal derivatives are now the normal derivatives in space and then the normal derivatives in time. So if you are in 1D or if you are in 2D, this is how it looks. If you are in the 1D, you have a normal derivative in space, a normal in space and an outward normal in space and an outward normal in time. And so if you go also to higher dimensions, you have the same, the same outward uh, normal, but now if you, have a, if you are in 2D, for instance, you have an NX and an NY and an NT. So this is exactly what it means. Uh, for, for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to consider a quasi-uniform assumption or quasi-uniform mesh, which means that our mesh is bounded. Uh, if we take the, the mesh sizes, we, we consider that they are bounded. And then we also consider the fact that we have discretized the underlining space or the underlining mesh are all being used. Uh, we are using here uh, B splines or nerves. Okay, but what are these B-splines or nerves? So to create a B-spline or a nerve, what you need is a knot vector. You need a knot vector of polynomial order P and then the number of basis functions. And we call this knot vector open uh, if the first and the last knot values appear P plus one times. And then we can consider these, uh, these B-splines as uh, a map in the real. So we use the cost depot recursion formula uh, in our setting to create these B splines. And then the B splines functions of order P, we say that have P minus M continuous derivatives. This is what makes the B splines very, very much, uh, uh, very, very uh, powerful tools to use as compared to the normal finite element as, we, as I proceed further on. Um, so this is an example of the knot vector. Uh, if you have uh, the knot vector p plus one, then this is exactly how it looks. So you see that if p is equal to one, then we exactly come back to the finite element matrix. But if p is equal to two and if p is equal to three, then we have continued, we have the power of the basis of these, their b splines because of their continuity or the, the, how their continuity works in this sense. And this is the, this is the second, uh, the, the 2D case where we have, uh, this is how do we also derive the 2D case for, the, for these nerves. So what I'm going to talk about next is really the variational formulation of, <clears throat> the variational formulation of the space-time setting. So in the first instance, I showed an example of how to derive it and how to have your, uh, the function, the bilinear form and the linear form derived really well. But here you see that, I have created that the bilinear, the linear form is just the first vector and then the test function. Okay, so in this case, the next one that I'm going to talk about is the space-time multi-patch DG. So what, we, what I showed earlier on 
it's just the one, the one that the, 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 the case of a single patch. So we have just one patch, usually uh, in the, uh, the computer aided design, the systems comes in several patches. And what we do is if you have a big domain, you can split this domain into sub subdomains, which we call patches. So each of these subdomains we call a patch. So on each patch, you can have this discretization done. What we are trying to do in the discontinuous Galekin scheme is to have all these patches being merged up into a whole big uh, computer, a whole big computational domain where we can work with. So I take each of my parametric uh, space-time domain maps directly to one of the subdomains. So for each of these subdomains or sub uh, space-time domains, I have one parametric. I have a parametric mapping. A geometric mapping going directly to it. So in that sense, it means that we have a quasi, a, the multi-patch, uh, quasi-uniform is just going to be the mesh size, the quasi-uniform of each of these patches being considered. But in the case where we consider all the patches being, the, uh, all the mesh sizes being the same, then we say that H is uniform throughout all the patches. And the same way we can consider, we consider discrete space-time uh, domain where we have each patch comes with its own uh, discrete domain or discrete uh, space. So we can consider all of this and then make one uh, discrete, uh, multi-patch discrete uh, space in this sense also as well. And then if we consider multi-patch, so you see that on this picture we have a patch one, a patch QI and a patch QJ. If we consider this and we consider the fact that um, the part, the, the the domain can be moving, then on the interface, we can have uh, the normals, the normal, the outward normal, and then the outward normal in space and the outward normal in time, in this sense, looking like this, as in this picture. Okay, so how does this look like? So it means that if we have a space time multi patch domain, we have QI, QJ. And then we have an interface, which is an FIJ, which is the interface of the of the of the of, of QI and QJ. And then we consider faces. That, so if you have a face, then it means that the face is either the the time upper limit, or the or the, if you consider the sigma t or the sigma zero b, the initial uh, initial phase of it. Um, we consider our, our domain to be such that uh, the discrete domain we are considering such that it is p minus one continuous, and this is really the power of the of these b splines because you have very nice continuity properties that are given. In this case, we are considering we're going to take a test function, and this test function we are going to consider now. If you see it, it has it has two parts. It has a vh which is being scaled by theta and then the size of the, of the mesh and then the derivative of, of, a, of, the, of the VH as well, where theta is greater than zero. So we have this test function. This is really the, the ability to use this test function is purposely because of uh, the continuity properties being given by the splines. So we are able to use test functions that look very fun, very, very, uh, that looks unique in this sense. Um, the idea of uh, discontinuous Galekin is like that because you have interfaces, you end up needing many, many uh, techniques to make up for the interfaces, and one of them being the averages. So if we take two patches, QI and QJ, then we say that the average is given by half of the of, of functions which are in, in I and in J. And so VI here is a function living in QI, and VJ here is a function living in QJ. That is, if we are in the interface. However, if we are not on the interface, then the V, the average of V is just one of these functions. We also have the jump. So the jump, you see that if you take a jump of the function, then we say that the jump is really the sum of the, of the function on I and multiply scaling by the, outward normal on that uh, patch plus VJ and then NJ, that is when you are on the interface. Similarly, we, uh, so we can have jumps uh, and then we have jumps in space as well as jumps in time. So if I say jump in space, then it means that 
the outward normal in space or the outward normal in time being multiplied by the function. We consider here upwind and downwind functions. And then in DG, we always use a very, very, uh, uh, this formula here, which, we, which I usually call the magic formula. Uh, that is, by the way, it's very possible to prove it, that if you take the jump of the product or a product of AB, then you can write it as an average and then a jump and then plus an average and a jump in, what, in whichever that, uh, way that you want to consider it. And so this is the same thing that we use, which is both called a DG for a uh, magic formula. So how do you derive your, how do you do your variational formulation? Take your test function, which is very known in DG sense. Take your test function, multiply it by, multiply your model problem by the test function, which is what I've done here. And then integrate the Laplacian term now with respect to the test function. And then if you once you do this integration by the Laplacian first in space, and then in time, you derive this, this uh, the, the next step, which is 1.4, is now you have the time part. After you do differentiation, the, if you do your inter the <coughs> integration by part in time, and then we have the green part, which is the integration by part in space. If you do your model formula in this way by just multiplying the Laplacian by <coughs> the best function. And then the next part is that you consider the time part, you multiply the time part by uh, the V part with respect to time and they'll do integration also by part or do integration uh, with respect to time in this way. Then, so if you go back from 1.4, you see that I have two terms. Once I take my Laplacian term and I integrate, I do my integration, I have two terms. I have the pink term, my magenta term, and then the green term or the olive term. So these are the boundary terms. So what I'm going to do is now I'm going to consider the boundary terms and then do what we usually do in DG with it. So I take the boundary terms and then with respect to time, if I do the boundary terms, I then do the interface plus the faces, the facets. So on the interface, so I have now a jump of the derivative in x, uh, the derivative in x of u times the derivative in x of bh which is a jump from this part. And then if I take the part in space, the boundary term from space, I also do the similar thing. And then now I have similar jumps and similar jump terms that I'm going to consider. So the boundary term from the time, if we do also the integration by part in time, we also, for the time parts, we also get a jump in, a jump in time also in addition. Um, then the nice thing is that then from all these three terms, all the terms here, which is a jump, 1.6, we have a jump, uh, 1.7, we have jumps. And then we realize that we can apply our DG magic formula to these jump terms. Because our solution is smooth, we, we say that because it is smooth, um, the, the, fu the function, the jump of the function in space and the jump of the function in time and their derivatives are all zeros. And so if you consider this, you realize that a lot of the terms will, be, will, go, will go to zero, and then we'll be left with some particular terms. But as in the case of DG, we add some consistent terms for, <clears throat> we add some consistent terms as well to our problem. So the consistent terms we add here are the, the, <clears throat> the average of the derivative and then the jump in time and space and then we also have the theta of h, then the average, and then the derivative in time. Then we add some penalty terms. This is what we usually do. We add a consistent term, we add a penalty term with positive penalty parameters. Okay, and the consistent terms here, we consider beta one and beta two, which are between, which are minus one and one, which can be minus one and one. So if we consider all this together, then we have a bilinear form our uh, multi a space time multiplied DGIGA scheme, which is given by this long uh, equation where I have labeled all the blue, the results of the blue terms, and then the results of the magenta terms coming together in a very seamless way, okay? With the penalty terms as well as the consistency terms, now everything is showing. Um, for, the, for the course of this, um, we just choose the consistent terms beta one, beta two to be positive one. 
and this I call it as uh, the semi uh, <coughs> the NIPG and then we consider Delta 1 and Delta 2 to be also positive in the case of these what you need is you need a norm and so we create we have this norm here the, of, we, we know that this is a norm of course so once we have a norm then we are able to prove two main things that two main ingredients we need we need the ellipticity and then we need a boundedness so we have a norm and once we have this norm we prove the ellipticity for the ellipticity the proof follows God's theorem and then using the formula that I've written again and then the next one is to prove for boundedness so to prove for the boundedness we introduce a new norm which is equipped with also we introduce a space which is equipped with a norm and then in this norm we are able to prove the boundedness of our bilinear form so i show some numerical error estimates once you have your boundedness you have your ellipticity uh, we use known approximation estimates which are already known um, we, we rely on this approximation estimate and prove and show that indeed we have an uh, <coughs> a projection which is bounded or uh, which is also uh, of optimal order r minus one when you consider si to be greater or equal to oh, sorry Stephen. hi sorry Stephen. Hi. uh we need to uh switch to the next speaker uh, so, okay, so could maybe you I can give you one finish up in the next so minute I show, okay i show you the results so okay. we show here the approximation and then we finally have an, an error estimate which is r minus one exactly the order that we needed so I show you some few uh, one two uh, results. If we take the D plus D, the D one case where we have a moving uh, space time domain, this is how it looks like, and then we have optimal error estimates exactly as predicted by the theory. And then if we take two D uh, D is equal to two, we take the same problem. Now we see that if we take if we slice it in time, we see exactly the same solution. And also we have exactly the same um, error estimates as predicted. So in conclusion, I, I showed um, from a single multi point from a single patch how we went to a multi-patch Swiss time TTIGA, and then showed a priori error estimates and some numerical examples with it. So the outlook is to present to work on evolving surfaces as well as when we have singularities in time or in space or in space time as well. So thank you very much. Thank you for the great job. Um, we don't have enough time, so we can discuss uh, later on together. Yes.